but steadily we should uh, start with this uh, webinar. I say first of all uh, thanks to all the participants that are here already and of course also to our speakers Andrea Furlan and Dave Snowden and my business partner Marco Baldini. Uh, we are here from Spark, Spark Innovation Catalyst. We're a small uh, Italian consultancy boutique but uh, with a presence on the, on a global level. Uh, we organized this webinar because um, because on the 11th of October we are going to have a summit in Italy uh, uh, with regards to both Agile and Lean, uh, the evolution of Lean and Agile in an age of complexity and uh, we wanted to give you the opportunity to already meet with our some of our speakers. Um, the idea of the summit has started because we wanted to create a platform, we wanted to create a, a situation, a, a meeting where both experts on the topic as well as practitioners would be able to uh, communicate, would be able to interact and in some way, let's say, redefine uh, what lean and agile would mean in this current age of, uh, of complexity. Um, Today in this webinar, we have two very special speakers, which I would like to introduce and of course uh, uh, would like to uh, interview a little bit uh, uh, to allow you to get to know them better. Um, first of all, we have uh, Professor Dave Snowden. I think most of the participants uh, already know him or even use his teaching in the work that they are doing. And Dave Snowden is the creator of the, the Kneven Framework and uh, SenseMaker. And he is the lead author of uh, the book, uh, Managing Complexity and Chaos in Times of Crisis, a field guide for decision makers. Um, he's a very popular and passionate keynote speaker. Uh, and of course, we're very delighted to have Dave at our summit as well as in our uh, webinar today. Uh, and he holds uh, various uh, positions as professor in uh, various universities. And he worked uh, previously in IBM, where he was the director of uh, institution, institution of Knowledge Management. And to start directly with one question for you, Dave, um, can you tell us how important that time at IBM was for, let's say, the foundation of the work that uh, we know you of uh, today? Uh, well, with retrospect, it was seminal. At the, at the time, I hated it um, because we were I was strategy for a company called Data Sciences. We were about to float the company, and I was about to head of a method centre for Europe, and I had acquisitions targeted. And over 48 hours, we went from being an independent company to being part of IBM, and it was like, oh my God, why? Right. But then I was quite lucky; they gave me a free floating role, which is do whatever you do, as long as you do interesting things. And interestingly, as long as you irritate senior people in IBM, that was actually in my target scheme once year, and I, I overachieved it. Because IBM was trying to shift from being a hardware company to a service company. And I'd managed the turnaround strategy for data sciences to make it into a European service company. So that's where it came from. And I think what IBM did is, first of all, they gave me the freedom to do that and lots of access to the labs. I used to spend half my time in the States walking around the labs, finding interesting people and having conversations with them. And yeah, you know, I could do what the hell I wanted with it. And IBM gave you an entry to companies that you would never get as an individual. I, you know, I think when I left, I had a big enough brand to survive leaving. But without IBM, none of this would have ever happened, I don't think. Well, that's and nice, that's nice to hear. It's still only tool, to be honest, but um, that's another matter. That's another. <laughs> And next to, uh, next to Dave, we have Professor Andrea Furlan. Um, Andrea is a full professor of management at the University of Padova, uh, Department of Economics and, uh, and Management. And he is also the scientific director of Lean Enterprise Center at uh, QOA. Uh, he publishes extensively in top management international journals on the topics related to lean management, continuous improvement, behavioral operations, and digital manufacturing. And, um, the question that I wanted to ask Andrea immediately is that how important is it for you, I say, in your work, to be both present, let's say, in the academic world and the University of Padova, as well as, as I may say, in the business world with regards to the business school at uh, Coa? Uh, nice, great. Uh, I mean, no, I think that uh, 
Well, actually, I think that it's very important because at the end of the day, what we are teaching and researching on is applied sciences, right? Applied social sciences in particular, if we, if we teach management. So we need to know a good teacher and a good researcher in management need to know the actual work, uh, work business work. And so <clears throat> there is, uh, <clears throat> If you just say in the university without having interaction with the real world, you will never be a good teacher. You will never be a good researcher as well. You have to know what you're researching on. And so you have to talk to the manager, we have to talk to, to we are constantly interacting with firms. And so for me, having the opportunity to be the head of the, of the Lean Center, the Quad Business School, um, that gives me exactly that opportunity to be in constant touch with firms, with guys like you. Uh, and so they allow me to constantly test my theories and hypotheses. That's, and also learn how to teach, better teach, and, and how to do better research. So I really think that, uh, yeah, particularly in management, in economics in general, but in management, uh, professor need to be uh, in constant touch with the real world and so exploiting the synergies between university and business schools etc is uh, for me key for my career thank you uh, thank you very much and um, I immediately have another question for you Andrea if I may uh, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking here about it, our summit uh, um, and it's titled, or part of the title, is In an Age of Complexity. And based on your experience, uh, what do you think are the main challenges that companies, uh, or even Italian companies, are facing today? It, Italian companies, you said, in particular Italian companies. Oh, that's, 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 that's a good one, and uh, not a really easy one, uh, because uh, um, <clears throat> you cannot generalize. First of all, I think that uh, you know different firms will have will have different have different challenges. You know, uh, a small firms uh, or a startup has different challenge than a medium firm. A listed firm has list a different challenge than a non-listed firm. A family business has different challenge than a Nigerian firm. A um, big multinational, so uh, they have different challenges. They are they, they are in different position. Uh, one of the, some of them are closer to the frontier, others are, are way behind it, uh, uh, the frontier of the competition. So they have really different challenges, it's very difficult to generalize. Uh, so first of all, first of all, I, 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 it, it is very difficult to say challenges that are, you know, across the board, valid across the board. But if I really have to say one, in general, many firms that I really have experience with, uh, and in general, is they should they should they should invest more in strategy, in strategy development. And I really think that one of the key uh, mm. um, weaknesses of many firms is that they really they really don't have a strategy, and uh, and uh, and they should and they should have a, at least a, a sense of direction. Okay, in order to have it, they should develop, uh, they should invest on uh, what in literature is known as dynamic capabilities. That is, uh, dynamic capabilities is a concept that has been introduced uh, in, 19, in the 1990s by two economists, David Tease and Gary Pisano, uh, that they, they wrote an article in 1997 is really famous and they introduced this concept of dynamic abilities uh, that has become uh, really uh, you know well known nowadays in, in, in the literature that what are these dynamic abilities they are the capabilities to change to, to change continuously okay to change as your environment changes and in 2007 David Tease wrote another article that is on the micro foundation dynamic abilities. And in this article, is basically saying that dynamic capabilities made of three processes are made of three processes: the process of sensing, the process of seizing, and the process of reconfiguring. Okay, sensing means you know sense opportunities and threats. 
of the external. So you, first of all, in order to change, okay, to develop a strategy, to develop a, or to change the direction, which is the strategy, you need to sense opportunities and, and threats, okay? So you need to develop, okay, and to act and to develop those skills. Develop, so sense new market segments, sense new uh, customer needs, uh, select new technologies, uh, uh, invest on in new technologies, um, et cetera, so far. So first of all, sensing. And I really think that the work of Dave is really towards that end, but, but I, I, will, I will let it go after. But, Sense. The second, the second dynamic capability is seizing. Seizing is create, invest. Okay. Uh, once you sense opportunities and threats, you have to invest uh, and you have to act uh, on them, and you have to develop the right business models. So to invest, uh, uh, to make the right investment in order to exploit okay, these opportunities or defend yourself from the threat. And reconfiguring is the third dynamic of It's about change. As you grow, as your strategy is successful, you have to continuously change your business model. And, and that is the and that is the agility, right? And that is the and that, and that is their conflict. So this, I think that if I want to generalize, okay, without giving, without using labels, okay, lean or other labels. Uh, the third should uh, these are the three main challenges, and they should find a way to better invest on them. Nice. I, uh, it seems like when you're putting it down to only three building blocks, right? It seems like even managing a complex situation becomes more manageable. Huh? Um, even though I can imagine that making sense out of the environment is not as easy as it uh, as it might seem. I have a question for uh, for Dave in, in with this regard. So in, in the Kinevan framework, and I think that's let's say the work of you that, that uh, we all know, um, you've been making a distinction between various types of problems, various types of, of environments. Um, can you help us to understand better, let's say, how you would discriminate a complex problem from other type of problems? Yeah, okay. I mean, Kinevin is one of three major frameworks in our work. So there's a new Asterine framework, which is all about strategy. There's the Flexious Curves, which is about market life cycles and timing. And then, as you say, there's Kinevin, which is what type of system are you in? Therefore, what type of decisions can you make? So the main distinction there is between ordered systems and complex systems. Um, and I can make a joke about Italian driving to explain this, so I'll come on to that in a minute. Please. So basically, in an order system, you have such a high level of constraint that everything is predictable. So the same thing will happen again the same way twice, not by accident, but by design. Yeah? So you've got a linear relationship between cause and effect. And that may be self-evident to any reasonable person, or it may require expertise. But the point is there is a right answer or a range of right answers which you can discover by analysis. So that's that, to be honest, is where 99.9% of all strategy methods with an odd exception sit. It's kind of like, you know, if, if, if you don't, if you've got uncertainty, you're meant to reduce uncertainty. Yeah, you know, that, that's considered a bad thing. It's a failure of analysis. And it's really locked into a sort of an enlightenment model of, of, of being and understanding and rationality. Complex systems came out of um, physics and chemistry and maths. They should not be confused with systems thinking. Now, they overlap, but they're, they're radically different in their nature. And they deal with systems, <clears throat> let's do it abstract first, where there's no linear relationship between cause and effect. So the same thing will not happen again the same way twice, except by accident. And there are more prosaic ways of explaining that. It's kind of like Alicia Gerardo has a wonderful phrase. She says a complex system is like bramble bushes in a thicket. So a thicket is a small, dense woodland, and bramble bushes are those thorny, sharp things which intermine it. Yeah, and if you try and walk through that, every time you pull something, something else hits you in the back. Everything is connected with everything else. So you, the only thing you know with absolute certainty is whatever you do will produce unintended consequences. And once you understand that, everything changes. 
So the big distinction between strategy in order and complexity is traditionally in strategy, you decide where you want to be and you identify how to get there. In complexity, we find out where you are and decide where you can go next. Mm -hmm. And if you want a simple way, the best way I've found to explain this, we call it the Frozen 2 strategy. So this is an excuse for everybody to go and watch Frozen 2, which is a great, great complexity movie. I mean, Frozen 1 is terrible. It's just Disney stereotypes. But Frozen <laughs> 2, they had enough money to employ some different script writers. And halfway through Frozen 2, the real heroine of the movie, who's the young sister without magic, sings a song which has been made famous in the Ukrainian refugees ever since, which is all I can do is do the next right thing. Yeah, I'm facing massive uncertainty. I can just take the next step and look again. Now, in complexity theory per Stu Kaufman, that's called the adjacent possible. So one of the big things in complexity-based operation is where am I? Where can I go next? And when should I look again? Not where do I want to be? So we start journeys with a sense of direction rather than trying to achieve goals. Mm -hmm. Wow. That, uh... So linking this to what you're saying, and also to what, what um, Professor Andrea Forland was just saying, um, what do you think, let's say, companies need to learn in, in terms of competencies or a skill set in order to be able to, uh, let's say, lift strategy and lift complex problems in a proper way? Well, I'll follow Andrea's lead here and say there are three things, all right? It's always good to have three things, people like that. <laughs> um, we identified these in the the field guide to complexity and chaos that I jointly authored for the EU, right? Um, we said there are three things you need to do, and they're all about what we call changing the dispositional state. To manage complexity, you're managing the ecology so that good things are more likely to happen, rather than trying to manage the things per se. So there are three things you can do for that which are important, yeah? One is build in formal networks fast. We have formal methods for that. Informal networks are the way you handle cross-silo knowledge sharing. And in a crisis, people fall back to their informal networks, not the formal systems. So if you're informal networks, and it's, it's like the fungal roots that link tree roots and keep them healthy. Yeah, you could, yeah, the formal system requires the informal system to keep it going. So, for example, a country like Singapore, where everybody does national service, has really effective informal networks. Whereas a country like Britain, where the ruling elite come from three schools and one university, that's a very unhealthy informal network, you know, because it lacks diversity. So stimulating and building informal networks is kind of like a key issue, because that manages the channels through which things will flow. So provided they're open, you know that when you need things, you can find things, even though you don't know what they are up front. So that's kind of like number one. Yeah? Number two is use your employees and your close customers as a sensor network. So this comes from famous experiments where you give radiologists a batch of x-rays ask them to look for anomalies, and on the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes scan it. So if we've got a complex situation, we present it in infographic format to the whole of the workforce. The workforce then interpret that situation in what's called high abstraction metadata, right? It's non-gameable. You don't know what the right answer is, and that's deliberate, and we use symbols as much as we use words. And from that, we can draw a map which those dominant patterns, minority patterns, and outlier patterns. So rather than commissioning experts to find out what's going on, you use a human sensor network and you get results back five minutes later. And then you start to say, this is a pathway, this is not a pathway. These guys have seen something nobody else has seen. I'll go and talk with them. Okay? So that's what human sensor networks do. And they, they take very little to build but you have to build them before you need them. You can't build them afterwards, and it's not the same thing as social media. And the third thing is you need to map your core capabilities at the right level of granularity. If you look at human innovation, it's never done by somebody inventing somebody from scratch. It's by finding something completely new that they're already very good at. 
right? So IBM dominates computers because they were the world market leader in punch card machines to control industrial machinery. And that gave them a head start in computer programs. Yeah. Um, yeah, 1945, a Raytheon engineer maintaining the magneto of a radar machine yeah, basically he noticed the chocolate bar melted in his pocket. He realized the significance. He put a metal box around the magneto. We got microwave ovens. Yeah, and the same is true of pharma. If you look at most human invention, it's what's called exaptation in biology or radical repurposing. And by the way, all the work on this was done by a group of us um, on Lake Garda from Milan Business School. We used to meet every year and talk through these things. So how do you create niche construction frameworks in which this type of innovation is more likely? And one of the key things we developed is you need to know what you know at quite a fine level of granularity so that you can rapidly repurpose it or assemble it in different ways. And most people store what they know at the wrong level of granularity, so it can't reposition. It's, it's final point here is a key principle of complex adaptive systems. You scale them not by aggregation or repetition, but by decomposition and recombination. So you break down and recombine. And if you think about it, that's how DNA works. Yeah, And that has major implications for organizational strategy, for market segmentation, for organizational design. You need things which can reassemble very quickly in different combinations. Yeah, And you can't anticipate what that need will be. It's very okay. interesting. I, I think, think Andre, you have also want to ask a question. Yeah, no, 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 just the hearing day. Yeah. So, so, so many, so many insights. Uh, so Dave, um, just by hearing you and, and, and reading what you wrote, uh, and um, I understand that uh, uh, your starting point is, is quite challenging in terms of theory of in management. Uh, um, as far as I understand, what you want your effort is directed towards uh, that you, you start from a big critic or criticize the what you call system thinking or scientific management. And, uh, and if I understand that, your point is that uh, an error that, that these, these theories do is that they remove okay, humans, individuals from. from we were actually scientific management doesn't. Um, okay. People actually demonize Taylor, but very few of them have read it. I mean, I, I used to teach leadership with Peter Drucker, and I made that mistake the first time I was on a conference party with the conference platform with Peter Drucker in San Diego, and he tore me apart. I ended up as a public humiliation on the, the stage because I was just going with the Taylor was mechanistic, and he pointed out quite rightly. I then burrowed into Taylor and ended up teaching with Drucker. But fundamentally, if you look at what came before Taylor, he was seeking to humanize the workplace. And he never got rid of apprentice models and management by duration. That The idea of management by function wasn't there. It was a very high apprentice model. And human judgment was actually very well respected in scientific management. What happened in the 80s is the popular end of systems thinking. It's kind of like systems dynamic more than, and to some extent, um, cybernetics, less so soft systems yeah, is it got caught up in two big popular movements one was business process re-engineering uh -huh. which then mutated into what we call six stigma right that's gary klein's phrase for it and also peter Senge learning organization both of them came from the same theoretical base so you had this rigid process it was a classic northern european dichotomy it's either rigid process or it's inspired leadership Right? And that has dominated the last 30 or 40 years. And people have increasingly lost authority within that system. Because people are trying to put the decisions into processes, not into people. So when Peter Drucker and I talked, we both said, actually, complexity theory is, it's a phase transition from systems thinking. Like systems thinking was a phase transition from scientific management. Yeah? Oh, and there was nice. always a difficult when they start. But actually, sorry, if I can get Hegelian about this, it's thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Um, systems thinking thought it was radically different from scientific management. It wasn't. It was actually more or less the same. But it created the space for complexity to come through, which is something which is radically different. 
And complexity takes the best of both. So, for example, we're reintroducing apprentice models because we now know that it takes three or four years for the body and the brain to co-evolve to the point where people can make some certain types of decision. It's not just a cognitive function. We also need to know that you need to build the narrative structures of an organization. This is Andy Clark's work because a huge amount of consciousness is distributed into social networks. So if you look at it, what happened in the 80s and 90s, everybody got seduced by a computer model of decision making. The assumption was human beings were poor quality information processors. And actually they're not. They, they make decisions in radically different ways. Consciousness is a distributed function. And I famously joked about this, and I didn't know that Kurt was in the front of the, the audience. Somebody said, what do you think about the singularity? You know, this belief that there'll be a point in the future where the brain can transfer. And I said, well, anybody who believes in that, it's probably possible for them because they've allowed their brain to ossify. Um, and that didn't go down very well. But I would still count that. Yeah. Human beings, social intelligence is as important as cognitive intelligence. So I think where we're going now is this much more distributed ecological framework. Whereas actually what systems thinking did was to bring in an engineering framework. And you can hear it in the phrases like cybernetics and feedback loops and models. It's an engineering culturally driven movement. Yeah, with all the upside and all the downside that goes with that. Uh, so am I wrong of this lead, uh, lead us to think about uh, decisional and decision making biases, right? Uh, like uh, in Daniel Kahneman, uh, behavioral economics, yeah. all, all those biases, how we can face and deal with them. Okay, um, one, one of those biases I know that you talk about uh, inattentional blindness, I think, yeah. That is kind, well, kind of the example of the gorilla tumor. So, I mean, can, there, are can, can, there are a group of us, and the leader is Gary Klein, who's a brilliant guy. We're basically saying there's no such thing as a cognitive bias. There are only cognitive heuristics. All of these things evolved is because overall they work better than not having them. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, evolution drives energy efficiency. So actually what's called a bias is actually in the main a good way of making decisions. Yeah. Not normally you shouldn't expect to see pictures of gorillas in x-rays. Right. So what happens when you realize that is you work with it, not against it. So if I look at what I said on human sensor networks, we don't, and I'll give you another example as well. We present a situation, we get everybody to interpret it without any connection with anybody else. Which means the results are a normal distribution. If we allow people to connect, it will become a Pareto distribution and we can't trust the results. And from that, we can draw the maps to show the different perspectives i.e. these are the different biases, which do you want to pay account of and what you should do? So we work with it, not against it. The other thing we do now, which is called distributed decision-making, not delegated decision-making. Yeah? And that is a really important difference. If you try and delegate decision-making, the people you delegate worry about what you really want them to do. Hmm. Uh, we use distributed decision-making. So for example, we'll say, uh, let's take a real example. We were working on safety with one of the big American companies. So we realized that one of the, and we found this in Europe as well, by the way, one of the main causes of accidents is actually the health and safety rules. Because people devise the health and safety rules on a retrospective analysis of the past and assume a normal distribution. And the trouble is the future is in the tails of a different distribution. So it doesn't work the way that people thought it would work. So what we ended up with is a rule which said, under these circumstances, you can break any rule. But if you're going to break the rule, then these people from these three roles and always in different divisions have to assemble, agree it and document it. And then you're authorized to do it. Now we radically reduced accidents with that method. And we're now extending that into decision making in the field. So for example, in customer interactions, by allowing people in small social groups with people they haven't met before, with transparent decision making, you can radically increase your speed of decision making without the danger of perversion or corruption in, in the way the system works. Yeah. So I say that those are all really interesting approaches, but it's this, I think the thing about naturalizing sense making, which is based in natural science, is it's fiercely realistic. It doesn't talk about how things should be, it talks about how things are. 
Or it doesn't yeah. talk about what sort of leader you want. It talks about what sort of human beings you've got and how do you work with them. Yeah. So we should not assume that the individuals are rational. They're not. Never have been. I mean, I mean that, that's an enlightenment myth, right? I mean, the, the way you make a decision is you scan about three or four percent of the available data. Um, and by the way, people need to read behind Cardamon. If, if Cardamon had walked across the corridor to his cognitive neuroscience colleagues before he started his research, he'd discovered we already knew everything he found, but with better scientific explanation. Uh, but you can't expect economists to do that sort of thing. They're not really transdisciplinary, right? Um, but basically, you scan about three or four percent of what's available to you. That triggers a series of memories, which are cognitive, physical, and social. You blend those together. It's what Kornbach called conceptual blending. And the first pattern which fits, you apply. You don't do a best fit pattern, but you do a first fit pattern much. Now, in evolutionary terms, that makes a huge amount of sense because if you're being pursued by a predator, you don't yeah. want to scan everything and look at best practice. What you want is very fast response, privileging your most recent social experiences. So once you realize that, and you know, we evolved to make decisions in clans and clans and families, not as individuals. Individual decision making is a comparatively modern invention. So all of that's important. And if I'm being wicked, um, sorry, I speak as a former Catholic Marxist here, right? I blame Protestantism. Because what actually happened with the Reformation, which came with the Enlightenment, is the privilege of the individual over the collective. Yeah, and then everything else follows from that. It's not about the individual choice, the individual interpretation, you know, the social contract concept, individuals deciding to join together. And that's always been disputable politically. It's now highly disputable in evolutionary terms. We didn't evolve as isolated, discrete individuals. We operated as so we evolved as social beings, and we still are. Wow, I really like how this. Let's say uh, we we started from let's say uh, the, the problems that uh, companies are facing currently. And what I what I'm learning is that uh, even though we sometimes are looking for let's say quick and easy fixes or solutions or even methods, and I want to bring our discussion a little bit to that. Uh, I'm really finding out that, let's say, you have to build first, let's say, um, the system, head, the, the organization, the competence of the company to be able to face these complex no, types. You do, but uh, I would argue that's actually simple. I think what strategy and operations have done for the past four decades is make things ridiculously complicated. Yeah, hugely complicated, you know, with huge numbers of consultants and everything else. Actually, it's really quite simple. It's where am I? Where can we go next? Yeah, and yeah. you know, it, it, it's simple, and, and that's actually quite simple. It, it's simplicity. We've got to break some complicated habits first. Well, let me build on on that because um, Andrea, of course, has been studying, let's say, excellent companies uh, for uh, for the last years, for many years, uh, and he's been identifying, of course, let's say, what tools and methods and systems they are using to be to to become so uh, effective, and I think. Uh, Maybe a big part of the research of your research on today has also has been around, let's say, lean management, uh, operations management. If you look at, let's say, the success of those companies, and uh, to say what what we're talking about now, uh, be able to identify where you are and what your next steps are going to be. What what do you see, let's say, these companies need to learn or need to change or need to adapt to to become to continue to become successful. Again, um, I, I, as, as, as you know, I don't like generalization, so I don't like a general recipe that uh, uh, work for all firms. Uh, the way I think about uh, uh, lean and, and other lean operational excellence or other practices is, is in terms of uh, the efficient frontier. So the efficient frontier is the place, okay, where the best firms are. And if you are on the efficient frontier, for you it's impossible to improve uh, more than one performance simultaneously. So you have to, to make trade-off. If you want to be more efficient, you have to decrease the quality of your product. If you want to be faster, you have to invest more, so increase the cost. If you are on the efficient frontier, you have to make trade-off. 
if we are under the if you are not on the efficient frontier if you are far away from the efficient frontier you can you can you can you can improve more than one performances at the same time you can improve reduce price improve quality time okay so the point is that uh, five percent or less okay of the companies are on the efficient frontier okay 95 percent or more are far away from the efficient frontier and if you are if you are if you are if you're not an efficient if you are far away from the vision here, lean works fine. Lean works fine because lean or operational excellence is all about you know, reducing waste. It's all about increasing efficiency. You can you can also imitate the others. Okay, you don't have to be very innovative. Uh, you just need to you know. Be more efficient, reduce waste, reduce the inventory, reduce time, re increase customer uh, satisfaction. So goes a lot. So lean and operational excellence work fine. The point is that if you are a firm on the efficient frontier, lean is not enough. Lean is not enough because lean is uh, lean operational excellence. Kaizen is about continuous is about making small improvements. The point is that the efficient frontier now is moving very very frequently and uh, unexpectedly so there is a high level of, of uncertainty because there are black swans of the events like you know uh, the pandemic now the war in ukraine etc that was not uh, foreseeable because there are new business models because there are uh, new trends like for example you know digitalization sustainability etc so everything so oh, okay so the frontier moves okay and and it moves faster and uh, in a more uncertain way so you cannot foresee it so lean is not uh, is not built to make the leap to the next frontier so if you are one of the firms that are on the efficient frontier lean is not enough you have to add you have to develop uh, and to invest in other practices that allow you to make the leap, to leap on the next uh, frontier and the next frontier and the next frontier. And so if you are IBM and you want to change yourself from a hardware to service firm, yeah, Lean is not, Lean, Lean really doesn't help you to do that. If you are, if you are, I don't know, uh, if you if you are an IKEA and you want to change the business model on furniture, okay, lean is not lean, lean doesn't help. You have to invest in something else. So I think that agile and uh, and the practices that are under the label of agile like Scrum can help you do that. Can really help you to explore, okay, new frontiers. Uh, but it's just a tool. It's just a practice. The the, the the idea is that if you are on the frontier, okay, lean is not enough. You have to you have to find a way to find the next frontier and make the leap. But this is not for all firms. So my point is that this is not for all firms. Just just, just those firms that are already in the, if you are not on the efficient frontier, okay, lean works fine. Operational excellence works. All right. And I think this is one of the things I'm really looking forward to being in Florence and discussing because we've got John and Nigel and Andrea and I think this is where we need to focus because I think one of the things we say in a complex system is there are things which can be managed like constraint conditions and amplifiers and are we can we apply lean techniques to the things which are structured within a complex system and improve things for example so not to the overall system but to elements of the system and I think that's that's interesting to explore. Um, I'm slightly more cynical about Agile. I've been involved in, in fact, I was one of the three people who created the SDM, which was one of the three big feeds into Agile. Um, and we did that non-competitively. We did it between comp competitors. Agile has become a movement of certification schemes, right? And that's a real problem, right? And Scrum is part of the issue there. It's one of the most effective methods I've yet seen for shifting something over the boundary from complexity into order. But it's crap for handling true complexity. You need different techniques there. And we're just launching a big initiative with actually quite a few people in the Agile movement. And it's an open source initiative, not a private one, to say, can we take all of the Agile methods, break them down to the different components, 
and then allow people to reassemble those components in different combinations based on what they are and what they do next. So if I take Scrum, for example, it does a two-week sprint. There's no reason why I shouldn't peel out that sprint and replace it with a three-month time box. So we need to get much more sophisticated, I think, yeah. in this whole issue about method. And people confuse methods and tools with frameworks and concepts. And if you, we can get that stuff sorted out, that will be a major contribution. You have to, uh, so I just want to, so David, I, I hear you and I agree with you, but my point is that uh, are these uh, practices or Scrum or more sophisticated ones you refer to for all the firms or just for the best? I think so because because they they introduce some sort of complexity, so they are sophisticated tools. If you, if you are yes, a firm, uh, of, I, th I think the problem is. Software, I mean, they came out of software development, right? And you can see their ancestry in that. And most software people don't want to talk with users. Let's, let's be brutal about this, all right? Users are an inconvenience, all right? And I've been, one, I've been on both sides of this fence. So they end up with a manufacturing process. You tell us what we want and we'll put it into our backlog and then wait for us to deliver it and you'd be really grateful. So they're effectively running a linear manufacturing model yeah we're seeing we're now doing work for example to put users trained to talk to it people because that's easier than training it people to understand users together with young bright coders together with systems architects and we might throw 20 trios at a problem for two weeks and see what they come up with before we start to define the process and then we're starting to work on complexity-based architectures where you get the scaffolding right and you get objects right, but then applications are emergent properties of the interaction of objects within scaffolding. And that's a complexity architecture. So we can take elements from Agile, but Agile is not, and it's still, it's still stuck in, it's stuck in its interpretation of lean, which I actually think Agile's interpretation of lean has become too structured and it breaks from the original concepts, which is why I think, I think this workshop could be powerful. But it is stuck in this very naive flow-based concept. I mean, we just named our new strategy model, the estuarine framework. And it's quite deliberate because in an estuary, the tide goes in and the tide goes out. You know, flow isn't always in one direction and there are sandbanks and granite cliffs and there are changing conditions. That's a much better metaphor yeah, and I say that this sort of what does lean mean for something which is complex is a really interesting question. It's like the elimination of waste. I mean, I've always said anybody who puts lean and Six Sigma together doesn't understand lean because lean is about eliminating the waste that bureaucratic techniques like Six Sigma tend to create. <laughs> so it, it's just yeah, so ridiculous to put the two together. But people have, have lost that concept. So there's an element of rediscovery I think we can do here. Okay. Well, I'm really, really happy also with, let's say, this, this, this conclusion or almost like a conclusion. And it's also an invitation for a follow up to keep on talking about this. Um, I'm just going to address quickly to the, to the audience. Uh, I already wrote it down in the chat box. If there's anyone uh, of the people that are, are listening who want to ask a question, they can quickly write it down and we can maybe uh, insert it uh, still in this webinar. I can't miss this. We need a renaissance, not an enlightenment. <laughs> nice. Well, that actually is, uh, let's say, maybe a bit of a, a, a bridge to what we, of course, wanted to say. Um, let me share my screen for the last time, and then we're working towards the conclusion of this uh, webinar. Um, My right screen is actually sharing. Yeah, you are. I'm All right. Sure. So, um, of course, uh, this was just a uh, um, let's say an appetizer to uh, to our summit. Uh, and uh, if you're an entrepreneur, a manager, an expert in lean agile, we uh, wanted to invite you to come over to uh, to Florence and to keep discussing the argument that we uh, that we touched uh, today. Um, Let's say there's a website where you can actually go to. Uh, it's uh, www.lean. 
2022.com. There you can either immediately go and uh, secure your seat, or maybe you can just leave your, uh, your email address so you can keep you updated on events like this webinar and uh, other things that are coming prior to the to the summit on the 11th of uh, October. Uh, what is also good to know is that there's a summit on the 11th, but uh, Dave Snowden is also staying a day longer in Italy in Florence with us because he's going to uh, hold a masterclass uh, on, uh, on his teachings. So apart from his keynote on the 11th, there's going to be a full day of, uh, of masterclass. So that's for sure something that we cannot, uh, that you can, shouldn't miss. There's also going to be Nigel Thurlow, who's going to be present in our next webinar. Uh, and he's going to teach us all about the flow system. So that's also something that we should keep in mind. And um, as Dave mentioned, uh, we need uh, a renaissance. And of course, well, you know, that's maybe the key reason why we are actually going to Florence for our summit. Uh, because if we need a renaissance, what is better than actually being in the city of the renaissance? So, um, well, uh, that said, um, Thank you, Dave, so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Andrea, also. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I really like the conversation, the way also we interacted all together. Uh, I hope that also participant, the participants liked the webinar. It was our first time, so <laughs> it's also going to be continuous improvement from here. But uh, uh, you always have to start with the first one. And, uh, and of course, uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing you uh, on the 11th of October in, uh, in Florence. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Well, ci tengo io a ringraziare, siccome il webinar è stato in inglese, visto i partecipanti sono anche italiani, però ci sembrava detto la lingua ufficiale fosse l'inglese, quindi parto da ringraziare tutti i partecipanti, ok? E vorrei ringraziare il professor Snowden anche il professor Furlan per la passione che ci hanno messo anche per i contenuti direi l'assaggio che ci hanno dato oggi in questo webinar non vedo come va detto basti a motivo per aspettare e iscriversi al summit quindi vi aspettiamo a Firenze grazie a Dave per aver citato appunto la, il rinascimento e quindi siamo appunto proprio nella culla del rinascimento per ridiscutere Lean ed Agile e grazie anche a Bastian per la splendida conduzione di questo webinar. E ci rivedremo, come vi ha accennato, presto per un altro webinar, quindi un altro appetizer, probabilmente con Nigel e altri speaker. E vi faremo sapere. Assolutamente. Grazie a tutti.